How was lunch? They've, they put a, they've done a great job putting on this uh, conference, right? It's been fantastic so far. And I get to go after lunch. I'm so excited. Uh, that means I'm going to ask you to participate uh, just so I know that you're awake. Uh, that would probably be the most exciting thing we'll do. Um, my name is Mo. Uh, I'm actually here on behalf of the Open API Foundation. Uh, how many of you guys are familiar with the foundation? Anybody ever heard of it? Great. Got a few people. Awesome. Um, for the rest of you, this will be a great introduction into what it is, what we do, and how we converge with what we're doing in healthcare. Um, so we'll get started by introducing you to Jack. Jack wants to build an awesome glucose app. He is going to track meals. He's going to grab your medical data. He's going to connect to your glucose monitor. Uh, he wants to also track your activity. And he's going to let you search all that. So. The first thing Jack's going to do is start to write his microservices or his code, and he's going to quickly realize we have a small problem. We've got a lot of APIs. So, how many people here have written an application that's required with one API? So the rest of you have not made apps that require one API? <laughs> how about two APIs? Three? Four? Five? More than 10. Both hands up, 20. <laughs> so this is a fundamental challenge we all run through. There are 17,000 different APIs. And I haven't updated it in a few months. Because we've all started to code, and we have all done this when we get to the API, right? You get an API, they have beautiful documentation, you're like, this is gonna be so easy. You start writing it, and then the next thing you know, something's missing. The data's not coming back the way they tell you it's going to come back. And how many developers versus non-developers do you have? If you're not a developer, raise your hand. Awesome. So, but you guys know what APIs are. Familiar with the structure. Heck, I got to ask. <laughs> um, so, when you're developing APIs, one of the larger challenges is it's never really consistent. And it's never really documented the way you think it should be. Because us as developers are always changing, no matter how often we have cat changes and what we do, we, we like to change things up because we find a better way of doing them. Uh, we move a decimal point somewhere, um, and then the documentation really doesn't get updated. So we have to wait for somebody else to catch up. And when they ask us, we go, it's working, it's just your problem. And it is your problem, you didn't know we changed it. So you end up opening Postman to kind of track people's APIs, and I guarantee almost every developer does this on a daily basis. And it all starts with something very basic. The conversation goes like this. Man, there's a lot of APIs for this thing. How do we fix it? Let's make a new one. How many of you guys have written a new API for something? Don't be shy. <laughs> there's not a single developer who's ever thought I could do this better. Uh, and a couple of Red Bulls later, and, and a, a nice long evening, you've developed a basic API that has no documentation, but works really well for your use case. So developing has really become kind of a challenge, right? We have incomplete APIs, we have random documentation, or sometimes no documentation. My favorite for all the designers in the room is Sketches API that seems to have no documentation, but a reference to a plugin. But this is very, very common. And uh, there are better ways, but we're frankly too busy. Developers don't want to write documentation. And we don't really want to tell you how the API works because we wrote it. Just here's the endpoint. Play with it. <laughs> so that's kind of how OpenAPI was started. Right? And OpenAPI actually started way after the answer was out there. But the idea behind OpenAPI is how can we make a specification? that makes sure that you can read and understand any API. Now to do this though, we have to make the developers write documentation, right? Which we're never going to do. So we'll talk about how we can do that. So uh, this is a very long way uh, of saying, this is too many words in trying to say we're not a framework. It's a specification, and I'll kind of talk about the distinction as we kind of go through it. 
But the idea is a set of specifications that you use that then anybody else could read. And it's got some pretty good support behind it. We add about two new members right now, averaging every month. The best part about this, and I'm not, I'm not gonna highlight many use cases except this one, is uh, anyone from Microsoft here today? They are actually the most compliant company on this list from a corporate standpoint. That just kind of changes views on things a little bit. So thank you guys. I thought that was awesome. They actually wrote a tool to convert other people's APIs to use the standard. And standard is really a bad word. It's a specification. I realize now there's a camera and I'm like hiding behind them. So the idea behind the Open API is really how do you create a hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy? How do you land on an API, read it, be able to write something against it and not have a problem? We've all ran into this. We implement somebody's spec. My favorite is the OAuth spec, and it doesn't have a return URL. But they're somehow writing against the OAuth spec. How did this happen? How do we ensure this doesn't happen for others? How do we make sure the code that a developer is writing and the code that I'm going to write against their APIs is always going to work? Because it's like going to the ATM. If your code didn't work, you won't get cash. So how do we get there? So actually, it started in 2010. Uh, how many of you guys are familiar with Swagger before you heard of Open API? So everybody knows Swagger. That is the Open API spec. So Swagger started in 2010. It's actually the most downloaded. I'll cover that in a second. And um, it was then taken over by SmartBear, and then it was handed to the Linux Foundation, and we started the Open API specification. And to me, I view Swagger as probably the next closest thing after um, WSDL. And the reason for that is you can still make modifications, it allows room for changes, um, but it forces you in a way to always expose the changes you make without having to do work. So Swagger is actually the most popular API framework, and this is where framework specification, I'm using them interchangeably. Um, 100,000 visitors, about 11,000 downloads every day, and it continues to grow. They're not all members of the Open API spec, but they are using it. So, programmers are very efficient, right? Uh, I've had people tell us, well, lazy. I'm like, no, we were just we just like to be efficient. And so, we decided let's put the code and the docs together. And I don't mean uh, commenting out and writing comments. That's not documentation, right? So what the specification allows you to do, really, is it's language neutral. You can write it into anything you're doing. It can be Java. It can be Node. We have um, frameworks and SDKs for every single one of them. And more get added for random languages. I think the most recent one was Go. It's not a random language, but Go is the most recent one. <laughs> um, and there's new ones that come out all the time. Somebody's trying to do one for Rust. That would be interesting, I guess. <laughs> uh, but the idea is provide a set of tools that let you write this out. And really, all we're doing is just coding at this point. It's a full evolution. Right? All right, so how does it work? So as you're programming and you're writing your code, you essentially get to just write code. So the whole point behind the Open API specification is basically a set of ways that you would write the code. And as you're writing code, we produce documentation for you. Everything you see on the left is auto-generated. All of it. Automatically. Now, it doesn't really have description necessarily if you didn't write one, but every single post, get, put, pull, all documented. Which is pretty cool. We recently launched the Open API Spec 3, which has massive changes. Um, so how many of you have actually used the specification? How many of you are still using it? <laughs> All right, so we lost a few in the process. What was the main reason for not continuing using it? Anybody who did stop using it? I don't want to hold you to it. Nothing. The promise of code generation never delivered. The promise of code generation never delivered. And why was that? <laughs> Why? Why do you think it was? I mean, it's a hard problem. It's a hard problem. Uh, that is actually probably the, the largest thing. Was this in healthcare? Uh, research. 
research and help. Uh, APIs are complex, but it works for 80%, 80%, 85%. When we get into healthcare, things get very fascinating, right? Um, and, I, and I love when I come to conferences and, and watch people's talks, if you realize how infinitely complex healthcare is, and just when you believe that you know how complex it is, you are proven wrong. Um, and if you want to make a change, we have a lively discussion about it. Uh, and hopefully we make that change. So, but the idea is, it is code generation for documentation. It definitely has its challenges. Um, and we hope to eliminate those as we move forward. But the general you know, rule of thumb that we go with is it's more of an 80-20 rule, right? We can't solve it for everybody. This is kind of where we come into play. And today we don't really have a big focus in healthcare. In fact, I think there's only two companies in healthcare in the open catch up. Um, and we're going to converge those more and more. And we're committed to that. At least for 100%, I am committed to that. Uh, so we're pushing those forward. We're one of the first members inside the Open API aspect, and we continue to push these changes. Um, but we also have to remember the general, everybody else out there who writes APIs who's not in healthcare, which is the 80% of the other market. So what happens when you generate this code? So anybody now can basically go online and see every mistake you made when you wrote code, by the way. Because if you forgot an ID, if you didn't specify your string, if you forgot to do something, it's generated. That's good and bad. It's good because you can actually use it to test your own API. You can have sample data that somebody could see. They can actually test authentication without ever writing a piece of code. They actually can just go to this browser, interact with your API in real time without writing a piece of code. That way they know when they go write code, it will actually work. Hopefully. If we didn't release a new version, then they'll have to go back and check it. Right? Uh, that's actually a big thing we're working on now, supporting versioning as well. So we, we say let's start with the API spec, um, but at the same time we try not to push any particular design perspective. So it's always hard having a uh, specification, <coughs> let's say, right? And, and certainly even with Fire run into this, right? How do you uh, almost try to stay neutral, no pun intended, but create a specification that allows people to actually expand it and keep going forward? And without having com too many diversions of that, right? Because then we're back to square one. Then we'll actually create a new specification that solves the specification to the specification we just didn't solve for. It. So uh, we do it by trying to be very portable and vendor neutral. We have a lot of support tools baked in, transformation tools. Uh, tools you can use to elaborate and extend on the API. We have specific ways for how we should tell you should expand about it. Uh, there are use cases we don't solve for. There are use cases we don't have answers for. In those use cases, we say use your best judgment. You could extend it and submit it back to us. That would be awesome. Most people don't, but that's not the problem. Uh, it really has the largest community. That's probably one of the best things. We have a Slack channel, it's pretty active. Uh, GitHub's very active for it. You can submit um, all sorts of issues and people respond fairly quickly. I'm proud of the fact that we've moved technical specifications rather fast. We went from two to three in a little bit less than a year uh, with releases along the way. You don't have to be on the latest version, you can kind of skip around. Uh, and the best part about it is as an end user, the person who's programming against your API, they don't really get concerned too much with the variances, right? And you don't have to rewrite your code. Every time I tell somebody about this, they think they have to go rewrite their code. You do not have to rewrite your code. The code generation, which <coughs> that Josh kind of smashing, is when you don't write or rewrite your code, yes, there are going to be more challenges. But if you start with the framework from the beginning, which I realize is unrealistic for a lot of people, it works significantly better. Um, and it has gotten better over time. But it does require some change. You don't have to re When we say you don't have to rewrite your code, it's kind of like a you really not have to rewrite your code? Yeah, there's some rewriting, right? But you, can, you get a very pretty spec, though, by not rewriting your code. Sometimes it doesn't work right, <laughs> but it looks really pretty. Uh, and it's got that point behind it. But this is where you have to go in and rewrite and make some edits. But we call those out. So the support tools behind that let you see that. It was, it's a valid point, I have to agree. Um, it's very pragmatic use. So what do we mean by something pragmatic? The idea is not just that humans could read it, but machines could read it. This was a very big distinction. So it's not just human readable, it's machine readable. Which is pretty neat. Why would we want it to be machine readable? Because 
if you've noticed, there are API discovery programs out there. If you want other things to use your APIs, it's a great way to do so. So behind the code that we see that's very pretty, there's actually something else programmatic that can be read. Um, sponsorship is pretty strong. That's actually really important, as anybody knows, in a, in a kind of open source project, right? Uh, and we've got really good support from a lot of big companies and small companies that continue to do so. Um, we actually had our first conference around APIs. There's a conference for APIs. How crazy is that, right? Um, at least that was my reaction to it. Uh, we've gotten to that point where APIs have their own conference. So, that's good though because you're getting general support and consensus from people. Uh, what's interesting too is we're starting to see other things come out like medical devices asking us how do you standardize on APIs? Something we never thought we'd hear from anybody. <coughs> of course, we have challenges. Right. Um, internal challenges and external challenges. Um, and one of the biggest challenges is this one. And I don't know how many of you guys have run into this problem, but I see it all the time. We could use someone else's APIs and actually deploy those on top of our service, but oftentimes we see doing that as losing competitive edge. And I was asked a simple question. And my question is, are APIs your end product or do you have a product? Because if APIs are end product, that's a different discussion. This is actually a common question we get all the time in our Slack channels. Not from developers, but when developers ask their sponsoring to join the organization. Well, but I want to have my own custom APIs. Will you write guys write a spec for me? APIs should not be your product. Lack of investment in open source is another one. Um, I still, you know, we're kind of getting over this hump more and more, and I, I, I don't want to get to too much, but I'm sure you guys see that. Open source is becoming a much bigger, much larger discussion. Um, who, anybody saw the Intel story that came out with the Minix OS? Anybody? Oh, yeah. All right, that was a pretty big one. If you haven't, you should go research it. It was probably the largest we've ever seen in the open source community. Essentially, in an Intel chip, there's an open source project that's baked into every single chip since 2009. All your phones have it right now. Well, if you have an Apple phone. If you don't, then walk on this guy. But, but what's crazy about that is they didn't tell them anything about it. So, but they did use it, and that is beginning to show how open source is really pushing the community in different, um, even within large organizations, and that's good to see. But they didn't rewrite some portions of it, so again, seeing it as a competitive edge. Um, believe it or not, APIs are still a secondary to software development. So how many people here have applications that don't have APIs? Nobody. One, two. So everybody else here has a product, their product has an API, an output API. Wow, awesome. If we were to go outside and ask that for most people, that's not the case. Photoshop doesn't have APIs. Sketch doesn't have APIs. Now, of course, we can raise the question, should they have APIs? Right. Uh, we really can't make everyone happy. This comes back to Josh's point. Uh, it's, it's a tough, it's very, very complex to make a specification that solves every single use case. And it will continue to be this complex. And it's nowhere more complex than healthcare. I would argue even more so than medical devices and telemetry devices. In healthcare, we have infinite changes of workflows, of implementations, of configurations, and mostly because the way people want to see things displayed are not necessarily standard. We're getting there, at least on the things that are common to everybody. Um, APIs are getting more complex. So you have APIs, one of the things we don't do in the specification that's very, and has been debated a lot, how many steps should it take for you to authenticate? How many steps should it take to get a user profile? So a lot of APIs, you guys know you go in, you make a call, you ask for the user, then you pick the user, then you ask for another call for every segment and piece of it. Is that better or is one full payload? Right. So there's a lot of these discussions, but they get more and more complex when you have recursive items that you need. And no person designs one of these in one particular way or the other, and we don't define that in the specification, but it is one of probably our largest challenges to get done. So the question comes up, is it a framework, or is it a specification? 
And it's tough, because the answer is yes. Um, we have frameworks. Swagger is a framework. But it really is about implementing a specification. And we aim to always just be a specification. So inside of APIs, it's actually a technical specification that you can implement yourself without downloading any framework. It does require some coding to do that. But there are tons of frameworks that have been written by developers for every language to produce that. Then as you're writing now in your APIs, you can actually move that forward. <coughs> so how does this tie into healthcare? How do we bring that in? Um, and we'll be honest and say we've had our challenges. Uh, we've been trying to figure out how to bring them together. But we're continuing and very committed to moving them forward. Um, healthcare is very unique, right? How many of you guys find it challenging to write applications in healthcare? Nobody? No. I might be the only one. It's happened before. Um, what do you think is the hardest thing to write for in healthcare? Is it just getting access to the data? Is that the hardest thing? If we had that, we wouldn't have any other problems? That's it. We think that's, that's predominantly the thing. It's the worst. It's the worst. And, and what's ironic is they all do have some ways of getting data out. But it's so hodgepodge is the word I'm using. That's a good answer. Uh, and you don't get all the data that comes out. So how do you merge that with a specification and get adoption? Right. So that's some challenge. Then how do you actually display all those specifications out? Now, wh where does Open API begin and where does Fire stop? Really, Open API begins where Fire standards do stop, right? So anything that's not within the realm really falls in that. But we're going to try and clear up those lines a little bit more and make it um, and much more um, easier to see and for everyone to kind of figure out what the differences are between the two. And then uh, you can actually get involved with us. I suggest you check it out, download it, play with it, run the code generation tool, see what happens. You might be surprised. Now I can keep going more technical, but I'm gonna stop and see if people have questions. I'd love to actually get you guys involved a little bit and not lose anybody after lunch. So, any questions? Are you very familiar with it? Not familiar with it? Thoughts? Uh, we have not fully converged between the two. So there is no clear convergence, but we are working on it. We're trying to figure out how we kind of bring them together. Uh, Josh has brought some very interesting questions to us, which we're constantly trying to figure out how to answer. Uh, unfortunately, writing custom, uh, healthcare gets a little tricky because we are very clear on how not, not doing certain custom parameters, and there's some things we have to do in healthcare for that. So how do you allow for that? So we have to modify the technical specification a little bit to really allow for it. But, uh, the good news is, inside opening that we move fairly quickly. Uh, there's a small technical team that works on it, and because they're working on it constantly, uh, we constantly have changes and specs going on. Uh, it takes longer to make it official, but you can still use the branch that we're working on. Just okay. What else? So, what would the It's a good question. Um, so, there's always been this uh, business world and healthcare. That's always, that's one thing I've noticed, and we've got to bridge those somehow. And I see that as one bridge. The second bridge is, um, we all pretty much write JSON code, right? Anybody not use JSON for anything? So that's kind of another area where we kind of bring convergence between those two. So it, it's not a gain for, it's value proposition is for both. In our specification, while we're very high level, we don't necessarily go down for a particular segment. Healthcare goes down very deep into a segment. Right, so fire is very detailed. Uh, our specification is not. But we could make fire more adaptable, and we can have more people be able to see it by actually also applying some of the specifications we have at the opening of uh, And I think more value will come from that as we actually come together to kind of bridge the two and actually apply them. So that's something we're actively looking at. Yes. You want a mic? Like. Yeah, I'm not very familiar with Open API, so while I'm hearing you talk, I'm wondering what a little bit more precise are the areas that we that we need to work on. So what I like to know a little bit more about boundaries and what what kind of things we need to fix. 
Yeah. You mean between, that's it. I mean, this is where I would involve Josh and Graham a little bit to kind of come up and, and chat with me on this. <laughs> because this is where something that we've had constant discussions on. Um, I'd love to hear your opinion. I kind of give mine at a high level. Everybody. And I, sorry, Paul and I talked about this before the talk, and I told him what to say. <laughs> um, some of you know that Jason Skin is not our friend, and, and we haven't had any luck sorting that out, haven't had the time to have attention to that. And, and so we've got some really detailed stuff we're really way down deep inside Jason Schema and the Jason Schema tool guys give us different answers and I think we're just kind of out beyond where they've all agreed. And so Mo and I were talking about process by whereby we can get together with them in the same room and, and see if we can make some progress on that. And the question stuff around Smile on Fire and OAuth and profiling that the stuff Josh was talking about. Again it's you know it's the, the last yards getting the last year sorted. What we'd really like to do is that when you produce an implementation guide, you automatically get an um, open API spec with it. That, that's our goal. What's that? <laughs> I don't know. No, that's not. Anybody else? How many people are just getting started with Fire? By the way? How many people are using Fire? <coughs> oh. For some reason, everybody's using Fire seems to be on this side of the room. Majority and the other half. <laughs> this must be the new users group. <laughs> uh, awesome. Well, welcome for all the new people working on Fire. Um, Fire has great community support, uh, and I suggest you keep pushing into it and asking questions and participating. Um, we'll, mer we'll start working together and merging the two, and hopefully here by next year we have this conference. We'll have a very clear direction on how the two kind of merge together. Until then, I kind of feel like the odd man out. I always feel the odd man out, Not, but only because I'm on both sides of the equation. All right, any other questions? Yes. Yes, so actually the interest has been growing quite a bit. So we, I never used to hear about it. When we first started this and we were doing it um, almost six years ago now, no one was really asking that question. In the last year, we've gotten more requests than the last five combined. Um, and now obviously that could be like three, right? So to be more specific, I, it does, I don't go a month now without hearing from somebody about it. So we've talked about creating subgroups within the open API spec around um, just for the healthcare industry. We've kind of worked against that. I mean, we have fire, how do we kind of find a little less? There's a lot more discussions even operationally on how they merge. Um, but I mean, more and more people are coming. And a bigger question that comes is how do they differ? How do they work together? How can they work together? Um, and how do I generate specifications out of what I've made from my fire application? Right? What's that? <coughs> Anybody else? Same set of people as well. Yes? The question is mostly for Graham. Perfect. So yeah, could we accept Jason's schema is boarding for fire? Right? Is, is Jason's schema valid for fire? Is that what you're asking? Uh, I mean, could we use Jason's schema uh, uh, as a profiling definition? And which version of Jason's schema allow? Yes, yes, you could. Yes. The answer is yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> There are going to be some gray areas, shall we say? There's some areas we're going to are going to run into challenges, but yes, you could. And those are some of the things we hope to resolve and kind of bring some to. The JSON community is very, um, what's the good word? Very uh, strong. Very, they have like a clear roadmap, and so making that alignment work is key. All right, anybody? Awesome. Well, thank you guys. Appreciate it.